Okay, so I believe we are up and running here. Okay, so let's start with our first one here. It may shock you, but the changes are in the subcutaneous fat. <laughs> um, let me make sure we're in focus for the screen first off. Okay. So go ahead and get your eyeballs in. Some granuloma, maybe some rosettes. Yeah, so there are definitely some crystalline rosettes, and you see them better actually if you flip your condenser down, increases refractility, and you make out those little rosettes. Yep. So you're thinking what? Um, probably subcutaneous fat necrosis. Sub-Q fat necrosis. What else does rosettes? Substeroid. Yeah, steroid fat necrosis and sub-Q fat necrosis are the biggies to do that. Okay, how about this? Um, so it looks like we um, got some lipocytes that are necrotic yep. um, and kind of encapsulated. Yep. Um, so I'm thinking um, the traumatic fat necrosis. Yeah, traumatic fat necrosis. The other name for that is mobile encapsulated lipoma. It's not a true lipoma, okay. but it's a nodule. 90 plus percent are women in the breast and it you know you don't even remember when your nephew kicked you when you were picking him up <laughs> it's just you know a year later when you feel the lump in your breast and it ends up getting biopsied yeah. so <laughs> so that's you know but you can get it in anywhere where there's fat necrosis <laughs> um, so one thing, the reason we ask you not to stack slides mm -hmm. is this. That's what happens to the cover slips when they're stacked multiple times. So, um, you know, it does degrade the quality of the slide over time. Okay, so you got reactive changes in the dermis, and in the sub Q you're mm -hmm. seeing this. So, is that some uh, calcium in the vessels? Yeah, and is it big vessel or is it tiny little vessels? Are you small ones? Yeah, and if you look, there's just a little bit of stippling in every tiny little vessel. Uh -huh. So what might give you a calcific paniculitis? Well, I know pancreatic paniculitis can. So pancreatic paniculitis can, but that tends to be around the lipocytes. Mm -hmm. This is in the vessel. So Just calciphylaxis. So calciphylaxis, absolutely. So you know, also in the sub-Q, but a little different pattern. Like. So, <laughs> so first off, um, let's have an upper ear jump in. What is this vessel and why? It's a pretty thick wall. So is it artery or is it vein? It's bundled. So see how the muscularis is all in little bundles? That's a vein. So if you see a valve, it's a vein. If you um, do an elastic, the elastic will be around every one of these bundles instead of just on the inside and the outside. And, you know, this bundled muscularis is very typical for a vein. So that's a vein. So if that's the vein, that being the vein, then what's inflamed? The artery. 
So you have a big artery inflamed, in this case neutrophilic, sometimes it's granulomatous depending on the stage. And then you have surrounding fat necrosis. So in this case, you have fat necrosis, but caused by what? Some sort of vasculitis. Yeah, and what kind of vasculitis is going to hit big artery? And then also deeper vessels with necrosis of endothelium. Like a polyarteritis nodosa, yeah, which often pre presents as a paniculitis. Mm -hmm. Very good. So it's uh, it's a fibrosis and the widen of the septum. So it's uh, um, erythema nodosa. Very good. So you have septal paniculitis, and our major <coughs> septal paniculitis is enodosum. Um, there are some other things that can, mycobacterial disease can involve the, the septum, so infection can involve the septum. <coughs> you can get necrosis of the septum with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, um, but most of the time, septal paniculitis is just erythema nodosum. In the acute phase, it's neutrophilic. Then it becomes granulomatous. Then it becomes fibrotic. So acute phase of EN neutrophilic, which is why drugs like colchicine work. In the chronic phase, granulomatous. And then ultimately, um, just fibrotic widening. like lobular and maybe granulomatous? So lobular and granulomatous. So give me a differential for lobular granulomatous paniculitis. You think like infectious, um, and First off, we should say one of the ways we know it's lobular is you have necrosis of the fat lobule with big and little circles. Right. So like TB. So tuberculosis maybe can do it, and when tuberculosis does it, is it, um, will there be lots of tubercle bacilli within the? Not typically. Not typically. So it's what kind of reaction? Um, Posse bacteria. Or what? Yeah, an oh, id. It's an id reaction. So ids occur with an infection, but there is no organism at the site of the inflammatory reaction. Okay, so what's your classic tuberculid that's a lobular? Yeah. Yeah, erythema endoratum. So erythema endoratum tends to be calf rather than shin, tends to break down and leak oil, is sometimes will show caseous necrosis, other times just granulomatous. And the, um, ultimately, the proof is response to anti-tuberculous therapy, but the patients will usually be positive for a test for tuberculosis. TB, PPD testing can be hazardous because people can lose extremities to the extreme necrosis they get from the PPD. Mm -hmm. So it would be a 1 to 1,000 dilution of a PPD if you go that route. It's one of the situations where you definitely want to start with a quantifuron gold. Quantifuron is not 100% positive, and one of the problems with Eandoratum is many of the cases are M. bovis in the gut, not, not chest TB, not MTB in the chest. So it's often gut, not lung. M. bovis doesn't necessarily react as reliably on tuberculin tests as MTB does. So it tends to be problematic, which is why sometimes it's ultimately response to anti-tuberculous therapy that proves the diagnosis. 
What other things, though, give you uh, um, granulomatous paniculitis besides? I know factitial. Yeah. I've seen a few of those. So factitial, absolutely, which is extremely common. It tends to be someone with access to syringes, mm -hmm. so they are sometimes have some sort of medical training or background. Um, so cute, fat so yeah. sub subcute fat necrosis absolutely can be granulomatous. One of the clues is you will often see rosettes, you know, crystalline rosettes vocally. Um, connective tissue disease, NOS, can do it and just broaden it to infections of all causes or, you know, will cause often a suppurative and granulomatous paniculitis. So, you know, you want to keep an open mind Infectious paniculitis is a common cause. If what you're growing consistently is a group B strep, then it's probably vaginal fluid that's being injected. Mm -hmm. If what you are growing are anaerobes or you grow nothing, and yet it's foul smelling, that's commonly, you're growing nothing because you're doing aerobic culture Remember, aerobes don't need oxygen to breathe. They'll grow in either aerobic or anaerobic. It's anaerobes to which to oxygen is toxic, so they will only grow in anaerobic environment. So negative yeah. cultures sometimes mean that it's predominantly anaerobes. Predominantly anaerobes commonly means feces being injected. So feces injected can be coliforms or more commonly anaerobic <coughs> abscess, which can appear sterile when you try to culture them. And um, group B strep is, is commonly vaginal flora. And the, those are, you know, they fall um, into the microaerophilic where they sometimes don't grow well on aerobic culture too. So, um, so you have to, have high index of suspicion and don't forget doing anaerobic culture, which is sometimes important. <coughs> Looks like probably a lobular paniculitis. Probably a lobular paniculitis. And then what is the inflammatory cell involved? Eosinophils. Yes. Wow. Overwhelmingly yes. eosinophils. <laughs> sheets and sheets and wow. sheets of eosinophils. <laughs> So what are causes of an eosinophilic paniculitis? Um, Church-Strauss. So Church-Strauss would be a classic one. Yeah. This was actually a patient with Church-Strauss. But what else? Helmintic and which, which worms tend to migrate in the sub-Q? Oh. Sure. So Toxicara okay. is one. And Toxicara is very prevalent in the southeastern United States. We've had two patients test positive in the last mm -hmm. few months. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's a pathogen of um, dogs and cats, mm -hmm. um, mostly cats who are feral in Rome. And um, it migrates, it leaves your, as opposed to a cutaneous larva migrans, it's a visceral larva mm -hmm. migrans that tends to go to deeper tissues. And then if you are a ceviche fan, then which one? That's nathostoma. Oh. Nathostoma is a relatively short, stout worm that um, is raw um, freshwater fish that's used often to make ceviche, um, sometimes sushi, and again, it migrate sub Q. So those, those would be the, the big ones. Um, this one. So it looks like it's a kind of a mix, but maybe predominantly septal. Are the circles all perfect. the same size, or are there big ones and little ones? Well, there's big ones, well, definitely a lot better component, but okay. there's also, looks like the septum is widened as well. So all lobular involves the septum, all septal involves the lobule. So the best way to, you know, really to classify them is, is the lobule necrotic or not? So when they're big ones <coughs> and little ones, go for lobular. Okay, so lobular. Okay. 
So lobular, and then what other features do you have in this lobular paniculitis? So if you have an uh, infiltrator on the vessel. And the infiltrate is diffuse within the lobule or predominantly a dense perivascular nodule? Dense perivascular nodule. Shockingly, the second one, right? So you got dense perivascular lymphoid or lymphoplasmocytic nodules. And then the what other changes do you see? Change. You got lipomembranous change. So and then with lupus and also lipodermatosclerosis. So you see with lip lupus and uh, lipodermatosclerosis. So which of the two is this more likely? Probably lupus. Probably lupus. Why? Um, because you see more like a cardiovascular infiltrate. You see nodular lymphoid infiltrate. Sometimes you see like interface. Yeah, so you may have overlying changes, changes of lupus. That's fifty. Really that's fifty-fifty. Sure, but you don't. So see fifty percent have systemic lupus. Fifty percent have overlying changes of lupus. That means fifty percent don't. Right. So it doesn't look like coronal lag, reads see lipodermatosclerosis. Um, so correct. You don't have stasis change. So you don't have nodular angioplasia or other stasis change, which goes strongly against lipodermatosclerosis. Um, presence of fibrin can help. <coughs> favors lupus and the big nodular lymphoplasmocytic aggregates favor lupus. And then if you're making a diagnosis of lupus paniculitis, what else do you have to consider? Um, subcutaneous uh, T-cell lymphoma. Yeah, so subcutaneous paniculitis like T-cell lymphoma um, evolves in the setting of lupus. So, so you always have to worry about that emerging. Septal. Prominently septal. So even though it spills into the lobule, do you have a lot of lobular necrosis? Yeah, they all look like the same size. Yeah. So probably Pre EN. Or yeah. And in EN, it, remember it starts neutrophilic, becomes granulomatous, ev eventuates in fibrous. And when you look at your granulomas, you often have, let's see if we have any nice ones here. Um, the ones where you get the little cleft in the granuloma, um, the so-called Miescher's granuloma. Don't see them in this one, but they don't have to be there. They're just, you know, they're often there. It's a characteristic, but not a required finding. Okay, let's see what else we got here. Is that the same question? Okay. So what do you see there? What? It's to you. And you just move? So I see, <laughs> <laughs> looks like the lobular, um, yeah, looks like lobular, it looks like there's um, inflammatory cells in there. Um, so in this case, there are a few inflammatory cells. And the biggest thing is that's about the size of a normal lipocyte. Okay. So in lobular, you have big ones and little ones, but the big ones are too big, so right? So is this more like lipoatrophy? This is lipoatrophy, correct. So what are your causes of lipoatrophy? Um, like long-standing paniculitis? So long-standing paniculitis, so the arcuate and annular abdominal lipoatrophy <coughs> that kids get are a granulomatous condition that eventuates in lipoatrophy. A lot of those are manifestation of connective tissue disease. A lot of those will turn out to be lupus. Um, some are inherited. Um, so like triamcinolone injection? Triamcinolone injection, and sometimes you'll see leftover triamcinolone as an amphiphilic deposit in the sub-Q. Um, I have the upper half of my body involved in this, and my kidneys aren't happy. It's a partial lipodystrophy, often has a C3 nephritogenic factor associated. But that's a lie. It's actually an inherited condition 
and I have no fat anywhere on my body, and I had diabetes from a young age. That's Lauren Seep, lipoatrophic diabetes. So they're all different types of lipoatrophy. You can have posteroid, you can have the granulomatous, annular arcuate on the abdomen of kids, some of which are connective tissue disease, some aren't. Um, you can have um, partial associated with nephritis, and you can have um, congenital or inherited widespread total body lipoatrophy associated with diabetes. So, you know, you've got your genoderms and your acquired types. So definitely lobular over here, great big ones and little ones. And then how about over here? Um, is pre encapsulated? Yeah. So the fact that you have an encapsulated fat necrosis next to a lobular suggests what possibly is origin? Uh, traumatic. Yeah, most of those are post traumatic fat necrosis. Um, remember, one of the other causes of paniculitis that we haven't talked about is um, uh, pancreatitis. Mm -hmm. So us, when we prescribe um, Accutane, mm -hmm. right? So you do, um, um, for our MF patients or um, our Accutane patients, regardless of the retinoid that they happen to be on, um, you can get hyperlipidemia. If their lipids shoot up to about the thousand range, they can get a paniculitis. So, <coughs> hypergenic is one of the causes. Okay. So, this we're not seeing much fat at all. Um, what are we seeing? Some hair follicles. Hair follicles. <laughs> and where does the inflammation tend to reside? Uh, it's a little deeper. Um, not the isthmus or infundibulum. But it's not particular. Well, infundibulum would be here. That's about isthmus. Okay. Okay. So it's an isthmic, which makes it sound like you're lisping. <laughs> um, you have hyperkeratosis, follicular plugging. You have some interface. You have a dense isthmic infiltrate forming sort of vertical columns of lymphs. Okay. So like a... Lupus. Lupus. Very good. And we got all kinds of things from out of the box. Okay. So it's uh, looks like uh, the crystallization in the Lipocytes, so it's the it's the um, panicular necrosis of the newborn. Yeah, so sub-Q fat necrosis newborn or post steroid with the uh, little rosettes. I mean, most of the lipocytes look pretty. Well, there's maybe some necrosis up there, but. They yeah, maybe some, but size. not a whole lot of necrosis, right? Mm -hmm. Infiltrate heavy or light. Decently heavy. Decently heavy. Mm, there's some rimming around there. Too. There is definite rimming of those lipocytes, and that makes you think of subcutaneous paniculitis like lymphoma. And this is lymphoma. And, you know, often they're large, they're hyperchromatic, they have nuclear molding, um, but that rimming of the lipocytes is very, very characteristic for the sub-Q lymphomas. If you are alpha-beta, you tend to do better than if you're gamma-delta, and the gamma-deltas tend to involve dermis and junction in an MF-like fashion. 
whereas this has pretty much nothing until you hit the fat, which is more characteristic of alpha beta, which is the more indolent of the, of the two. Granulomatous, and how about this area? Some, like some caseous necrosis, like some necrosis yeah, makes you think of. Yeah, so you have to think of infection, mm -hmm. factitial, erythemendoratum, those would be your, your key things. Um, there are some neutrophils in here, so what? anytime you see neutrophils in a pediculitis, you have to think of infection, but what else do you have to think of? Antitrypsin. Alpha one antitrypsin, which um, you know it's just thinking to order the blood test, and because of the implications for lung and liver, very important diagnosis to make. It looks like predominantly lobular. Some look to see if there's like some membranes there. It's a little bit of lipomembranous change here. That septum is pretty wide. Yeah. Um, clinically, it was enodosum. Mm -hmm. There is a little bit of lobular necrosis here. So what do you do when, you know, it looks like enodosum, but there's some lobular necrosis. You look for things on both sides. You look for all um, causes of septal as well as causes of lobular paniculitis. Um, just walk through another couple of EN examples. This is kind of a midlife EN. It's no longer neutrophilic. You have lots of granuloma. <coughs> it's predominantly within the septum. The granuloma tends to lie at the periphery of the septum, the giant cells. Here's another EN that would be... Now here we also have a dermal infiltrate a little bit maybe of interface. I might wonder about connective tissue paniculitis in this particular one, despite the fact that you've got a few granulomas there. You can have lupus paniculitis, but you can also have connective tissue paniculitis, NOS, which is a, um, you know, just a chronic granulomatous paniculitis, and on your workup, the only thing that's positive is an ANA, and they've got arthralgia, and they've got smoldering connective tissue disease. So not all connective tissue disease paniculitis is Ellie profundus. Okay. So, so for here, I mean, some of those look like they're vertical streaking or unless it's just like separative. So let's look, is it more separative or is it more lymphoid? Yeah, more separative. So you've got a separative paniculitis, and when you've got factitial TB or other infection. Yeah, so infection. other infection. I'd still bring in alpha-1 antitrypsin as a possibility, because that can be complete coagulative necrosis of the septum. It can be abscess. It's a big spectrum. So. You know, if you see newts in any way, shape, or form, or necrosis, uh, liquefactive necrosis, make sure you check alpha-1 antitrypsin. Um, in this case, um, the ultimate was factitial, which means you're going to get infection, and commonly, though, you're growing nothing, partly because you're not doing anaerobic mm -hmm. cultures. Um, Okay, I think we've hit the big key entities there. Let's grab a potpourri box. 
because we are halfway through the year, so even the first years know half of everything. And you know, this is the time of the year where you want to start, especially the upper years, you want to start plowing through potpourri boxes at high volume because that is a way to test yourself and learn. Upper year want to help? Some kind of metastatic. Typical. Yeah, metastatic, and you can see that it's adeno. You see the little duct mm -hmm. there, right? And especially when it's lodged, large aggregates like that in the lymphatic, that tends to be an inflammatory pattern, which can be other types, but is characteristic of breast. Honestly, what we maybe will do is just have anyone shout out so we keep <laughs> on moving. Partly because we're doing, we're hitting some chapters the first years haven't done yet. DF. Yeah, why DF? So you have induction. So first off, not many, not many tumors or growths have acanthosis over them, right? Mm -hmm. Most things have effacement of the epidermis. Acanthosis goes with granular cell tumor, spits, DF. And DF variants like epithelial histiocytoma, right? So first thing is there's acanthosis rather than effacement. There's follicular, sub follicular sebaceous induction. That's pretty much DF right there. You haven't even looked at, the, at what's down below and just the associated epidermal changes tell you it's DF underneath. I'll tell you that this is a piece of something much wider, and this is scalp. Neva sebaceous. So, you know, you can't tell the biopsy is small, so you can't see the broad part of the broad, bald, bumpy, bubbly of a neva sebaceous. So, I think it is in epidermal. Looks like um, some pink nodule. Um, looks like a granular change. Some clefts. The, the nuclei are very much elongated. Oh, so it's from Lura or from. Oh, this is. Um, Lyomyoma. Lyomyoma, well done. So that is a pyloliomyoma, and this patient has a blastoid segment of, of lyomyomas. And um, what, what syndrome do you have to worry about? Reed. Reed, and what do you get in Reed syndrome? Uterine. So uterine, what else? Uh, Reed kidney issues. Yeah, kidney, and what do you get? What kind of tumor in the kidney? Oncocytoma, which is an unusual tumor, which is, you know, what suggested you get familial unusual tumor with a cutaneous marker. You know, it early on suggested a syndrome. Um, it's not your usual renal papillary. It's a different type of tumor. Um, 
and the um, Lyme myomas are a marker for the fumarate hydratase deficiency. Um, when you look at the edge, it's not encapsulated. It tends to have little arms that stick out like the spokes of a pinwheel, and that's typical for a Lyme myoma. Pinwheel, pink pinwheel tumor. Okay, so we're really large tumor, kind of mixoid areas. Yeah, large tumor, mixoid. So, what do you think of with large mixoid things? This is fellow level case. Large mixoid masses. Yeah, mixofibrosarc, UPS, which is, you know, they're kind of on the same spectrum of what used to be called malignant fibrocystocytoma. Um, and that's probably where you'd focus with this. Um, it's more cellular than things like um, superficial angiomyxomas and, and the like. Mixoid neurothechioma, but that tends to be little nests within the dermis. All right, this is a big sub Q mass, and it was um, mixofibrous heart. Was the, um, yep. Yeah, a lot of ghost cells there. Pilometricoma. Pilometricoma. Very good. So calcifying um, epithelioma of malherb or pilometricoma or pilometrixoma, they're all they're all acceptable names. It's like a steatocystoma. Like a steatocystoma. You have the shark tooth lining and the sebaceous glands. Often they're filled with oil. They collapse. They have vellus hairs. Uh, you worry about Merkel. You worry about Merkel. Why? Uh, you have this blue. You have maybe like parallel theeks. That Smudgy are blue, and you have parallel theeks that are the trabecular pattern. So the old. What's the old name for Merkel cell carcinoma? Trabecular carcinoma, <laughs> yeah. because of the trabecular pattern that's characteristic. Okay, so fellow case, all they gave us was stratum corning. <laughs> yeah, it looks like there's a nice column. Yeah. Nice columns, and the nice columns correspond to to furrows. In fact, they all look like they're furrows. So probably, probably okay. Ridges it's are risky. Okay. Furrows are fine. Right. <laughs> Depending where you practice, um, in New York, <coughs> is very intolerant of scars, so that was the typical acral biopsy in New York. A lot of pink stuff. Well done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you haven't covered it yet <laughs> this year. So, okay. Anyone else? So, KS angiosarcoma. But go back to what Rachel said. Lots of pink stuff. What's the pink stuff? There are lots of fibrin cores. We'll go back to Rachel. What do you think, Rachel? <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly, Masan, Masan tumor, and so you picked up on the lots of pink stuff within those pores, <laughs> which is, you did nail it, which is key to the diagnosis that this one is not KS, is not angiosarc, is a Masan's intravascular papillary endothelial hyperplasia mm -hmm. with the fibrin cores, the lots of pink stuff. From a mile high, 
first off, we gotta get. So it looks. Is it pedunculated or is it just old? Well, it's itself? like way out. Yeah. Sorry. Try to get it for those on monitor again. It's probably just bold in me. Okay. Yeah, so either it's a very, very skinny patient, or it's a pedunculated <laughs> lesion, or it's a shave that just kind of folded over on itself. Okay. So, first off, broad or not too broad? Not too broad. Ends in a nest or doesn't end in a nest? It does end in a nest. Um, PEH or effacement? Um. PEH, and you got it right mm -hmm. even though it wasn't the <laughs> second one. Very good. <laughs> and then the cells tend to be round, oval, or spindled? Some are spindled. So spindled. So do you know any fairly dark <coughs> spindled thing that would be eruptive as a brand new, really dark lesion on the thigh of a young woman? Pigmented spindle cell nevocivory. Yeah, which either is or isn't a spitz variant. Mm -hmm depending on your religion. Because <laughs> um, we have left the realm of science at that point. Keloid. Keloid. So you got that big mass and you got the bubble gum collagen that is a keloid. So there is a um, follicular plugging. Oh, this is oh. Porokeratosis, <laughs> 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 you are <laughs> correct. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's also the one where there's <coughs> silence and then oh, people yeah. start <laughs> doing like a. Yeah, that usually is going to get on it. really compact horn and is the compact horn the same thickness or is it focally thicker? Focally thicker. Probably corresponds to? Follicle. Yes, so especially since there's a rectal pili right under it. Right, so plugging. follicular plugging and then what else do you have? A vacuoles. Okay, so and it had, do you have a so maybe you like you connective tissue, like burned yeah. out connective tissue? So you don't have squamatization of the epithelium, you have a vacuolar interface. So vacuolar Vacular interface, pigment incontinence, follicular plugging, dense corneum, so probably connective tissue disease, and we usually say that because you don't know if it's lupus or DM. And you have to, you know, keep both as possibilities. Yep. And the other thing that helps is you have a compact horn and then you have little round holes in it like someone has taken a cookie cutter or a two millimeter punch and taken lots of little holes out of a compact horn. That's characteristic wart. What's that a little gray layer like at the, at the bottom of the cornea? Is that oh, well there, oh this? Yeah. Is that That's like a stratum lucidum. Okay. Which you can get in lichen simplex chronicus, you can have in acral sites, but you can have with any form of hyperkeratosis. Well, you can get a loose I'm seeing like flagels. Is that church spiring? So flagels will flagels. give you um, church spiring, but doesn't give you this type of horn. So that coarse basket weave, the little holes, or little round holes punched mm -hmm. out of a yeah. dense horn is warty. Yeah, that's the easiest yeah. thing at scan. So, looks like um, pretty thick acanthotic happening. And the cells are kind of clear. Yeah. So, clear cell acanthoma, true or false? Why false? 
Yeah, so why clear cell bones? Some atypia more so. Yeah, atypia, and look at the nuclear cytoplasmic ratio in the areas that aren't clear cell. Like an island or something. Yeah, good island. Yeah. So clear cell bones. Oh. So it is something oh. with striated muscle, and it has these little CD sticking out from it. So maggot, and this is this was a wound myiasis. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But the maggots can have tumors. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, there's a lot of sebaceous glands um, and like follicular kind of plugging. Or like so lots of um, follicular plugging, yeah. horn cysts. And I heard clonal seb being offered, which okay, I like yeah. very much. There's a little bit of spindling in there, which is um, good for an irritated seb K. Most other things don't spindle like that in the epidermis. Irritated sebs commonly do. The <coughs> pigment, when clonal seb Ks are pigmented, the pigment is restricted to the clone. When they're irritated, the spindling and eddies are restricted to the clone. When they're inflamed, the lymphs are restricted to the clone. Is that an incidental What? Well, it's just, why would you excite it like that? Oh, why, why <laughs> such a big piece? Probably because they thought it was melanoma. Okay. <laughs> you know, it was probably yeah. pigmented yeah. and they did an excisional biopsy Shave. rather than a shave, but Shave that's a very strong. good, you know, good point. You know, why would that have been an excision of biopsy? Um, looks like there's some perivascular inflammation. So some perivascular inflammation, and most of it is there, there, or here? Um, kind of here. Kind of <laughs> here. <laughs> exactly. And so what is here? What vessel is here? It's more like the capillary. Yeah, more like the capillary. And then there's a little bit of brown pigment in there. Mm -hmm. What do you think that pigment is? What would you guess? Um, hemosiderin. Probably hemosiderin because you think this is? PPE. Yeah, pigmented purpuric eruption. So you can call it PPE, PPC, PPP. So progressive pigmentary purpura. Pigmentary purpuric eruption, purpura pigmentosa chronica, <laughs> there are all sorts of names for it. So anything with multiple P's and some other letter is okay. usually pigmenting purpura. Yeah. And what's the biggest thing mm. to keep in the back of your mind in a differential? MF. MF. Mm. Right? So look for very subtle epidermotropism, because that's not uncommon for MF to masquerade. <laughs> So you definitely have a split in the corneum with some pus, mm -hmm. and then so you're going to have to decide what's primary change and what's secondary change. Where do you think the primary is? Around the vessels. Yeah, sort of where the arrow is. So you're there. You're there. And so what do you see? Fibrin and karyorectic debris, expansion of the vessel wall. <coughs> Some sort of small vessel vasculitis. Yeah, so a small vessel vasculitis. Is endothelium gone or is endothelium preserved? Mm, I guess it's preserved. Yeah, you can still see mm -hmm. oval things. So, you know, if it's gone, then you worry more about anca septic rheumatoid. Right. When it's preserved, it's the other group, the mm -hmm. HSP. Um, Connective tissue, mixed fiber, cryoglobulinemia, the, the small vessel vasculitis group. So there is a many prolific giant cells diffused in the abdomens. Could be prolific, prolific 
fibrotosis? Yeah, a absolutely correct. So pleomorphic fibroma. So you commented on the stellate hyperchromatic nuclei, the pleomorphic nuclei, and it is sitting in something that otherwise looks like just a tag with heavy collagen. They're just peppered across it. So pleomorphic fibroma, very well done. This looks like it could be Bowen's disease. So it looks like it can be Bowen's disease. It's got a peripheral palisade and a little bit of a mm. thicker base membrane zone. Trichelomoma. Like a trichelomoma. Mm -hmm. We call it that because they're tricky, right? So the trichelomoma, um, outer root sheath differentiation in a little warty papule. It's deep, it's oval, it's encapsulated, <laughs> it has some subcapsular edema. What is it? Schwannoma, yeah. and then you've got varicae bodies here. <laughs> but anything that's deep, oval, encapsulated with subcapsular edema, and usually in a crescentic zone, is. is a schwannoma. So how about this one? Some type of nevus. Like yeah. Some kind of nevus, and cold. then is it um, confluent or is it patchy? Mm. Patchy. A little patchy. Yeah. So patchy or nevi tend to be with sort of little interstitial patchy areas disconnected from the rest, tend to be. Congenital. Oh, okay. Benign. That is true. <coughs> so there's something kind of big. Big. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I thought some of them were like fibroblast, but it looks more like yeah. filial. So epithelioid or fibroblastic, and then one of the clues here is you got lots of red cell extravasation. And when you look at these cells, see all these little microvesicles in there? So you've got a fibroblastic proliferation making collagen, lots of red cell extravasation, edema, and these tiny little microvesicles everywhere. So Fellow level case, anyone? Yeah, nodular fasciitis. This is not a young nod fasci where you're seeing lots of <coughs> tissue culture like fibroblasts. It's an older fibrosing nod fasci, but you still have amphiphilic mucinous areas. You have a variety of spindle cells. It's making collagen. It's edematous. You have red cell extravasation, and you have all that little microvesiculation within the stroma. Is very characteristic for an odd fash, which is nodular fasciitis. Looks <coughs> so like we have a subepidermal blister with maybe some festooning. Yep, so subepidermal blister, maybe some festooning, makes you think of PCT. Makes you think of PCT. It should be on acral skin, which the corneum looks like, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Should be on acral sun damaged skin, and it looks like there's a little bit of um, solar elastosis in there. Mm -hmm. And then you look for caterpillar yeah. bodies, and eh, there's maybe a little caterpillar wannabe there. <laughs> <laughs> and then you look for hyalinization around those vessels, because you always should have some hyalinization. <laughs> those black things protruding into the vessel lumen? Like hobnail endothelial cells. So you have hobnailing of endothelial cells and a superficial 
lymphangioma-like configuration, but there's also a little proliferation deep. There's something going on around the erector pili. Almost looks like capuches, where you have these little clefts around the erector pili. So what would look like capuches deep and a hobnail lymphangioma-like configuration high? THH, targetoid hemosiderotic hemangioma. The other name for it is hobnail hemangioma. Okay, so how do put this into a description? What are you seeing? Um, very pink specimen with a pretty prominent acanthosis. Yeah, to the point of, what do you call really exaggerated acanthosis like that? Big spiky pH. And then what are all of these things of neutrophils? Pus. So what's your differential for PEH with pus? Yeah, oh. so I hear it whispered <laughs> here. Here come big green leafy veggies. <laughs> so here come big green leafy veggies. And the H is halogenoderma, the C, chromo, um, the B, blasto, green. Granula mangrenali, leafy, leash and veggie, vegetans, and then if you look around, we're starting to see with some brownish things in there, and this one was chromo. But you got to sort of run down the whole differential. Now we're done. Time wise, we're done. Okay, not bad. We did almost 50 potpourri cases. I was just waiting for Shane to fall. Yeah, I was just waiting for Shane to fall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Elson, are we still recording? I'm sorry? Are we recording? Uh, yeah, um, okay. give, me, give me a second. Let's get...